let's put it simply, City of Troy is the best horse and he's going to win by miles. Um, Hans Anderson's going to bounce out, set a solid enough gallop. Ryan's going to sit in second or third and he's just going to, he's just going to bulldoze them all into submission. Hello and welcome to this very special episode of Inside Track brought to you by William Hill where we are previewing a huge weekend of racing at Sandown and Haydock, of course, with the Eclipse being the feature race of which. My name is Kate Tracy and joining me are Louis Stewart and William Hill Ambassador Nick Luck. So lads, great to have you here with me. Hopefully really looking forward to this. But first and foremost, though, of course, I want to ask your opinion. 5 p.m. Dusseldorf, Saturday. Louis, are we winning? I hope we are. I mean, it's been pretty boring so far, to be brutally honest. Um, they've got to step up their game. We've had some very easy matches and still kind of really scraping in. So um, hopefully we have a, a performance maybe like City of Troy on Saturday. Oh, nicely. Nicely done. I mean, Nick, are you looking forward to 90 more minutes of uh, Southgate ball? Well, it's pretty turgid the other day until the 94th minute or whatever it was, or the 96th minute. So, yes, I suppose so. It'll be on anyway. It, it will be on, exactly, and we will be in our usual senses of it's coming home the whole way through it, no matter what is going on actually on the pitch. We tend to be slightly deluded as a country in that sense, but we won't be deluded about the racing anyway, because now that we've had the football covered and out the way, onto the real business, of course, of the racing itself. Declarations are in. We're going to be proving four races from Sandown and Haydock. Plenty to talk about. Let's get cracking. Now, we're going to begin at Sandown with the 150, with the Coral Charge, the Sprint, Group 3, for the three-year-olds and over over five furlongs. Of course, the first ITV race, William Hill have a top price guarantee. That offer is available every time racing is on ITV. Every runner in the first race on ITV, William Hill have a top price guarantee. Nice little rhyme there to go with it as well. Right, first race then, speed scissor to the four in this one. So, Louis, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, I think it's going to be a very fast race, Kate. Um, plenty of pace on paper. Um, horses that go forward from all kind of angles and, and live your dream. Although um, is dropping back in, in class, uh, I just worry about the, the track maybe being a bit too sharp for him. Uh, no, stiff for him, sorry. Uh, he has won there before, but that was a couple of years ago now. And I just think he's not quite got that same zest to put um, a few lengths uh, apart from the field in, in the first couple of furlongs, which is what we've seen him to such good effect last year. OK, so you don't fancy him then over this track and trip again. Like I say, he is the fiver now. That course and distance went to his name previously, but I believe that was actually in Handicap Company back in the day, wasn't it? So instead of living the dream then, where are you, who are you siding with? I think Twilight Calls is probably going to get a much um, smoother passage through. Ryan has, has kind of got the race to play into his hands where they'll go hard up front and he can just sit off the pace and, and come with a, a fast finish. But I think this stiff five is perfect for this horse. Um, good form at Ascot this year so far. So I think uh, Twilight Calls could show up um, big on the day. Twilight Calls currently priced up at 130 at the time of recording, it should be said, on Thursday afternoon. But taking on the favourite then, Nick, is Lou. Are you so bold? Yeah, I don't think Louis being that bold, and I agree with him. I think living the dreams a very hard horse to back at these odds, even though he stands clear on ratings. And his form, certainly at the back end last year, the Nunthorpe victory, the two excellent runs in America, entitle him just to burn these into submission. He's not very well drawn. The ground is going to stay sound, and that means that advantage to the far rail, low-drawn horse over five furlongs is that much more pronounced. So he's going to have to, even by his standards... He, he, no matter how quick he is out of the gate, he's going to have to do some work to get over. And he's also going to give some of those horses who like to be covered up a perfect draft into the race. And it is a stiffish five. So I get the case for Twilight Cause. He's got loads of ability, but God almighty, he doesn't half owe Ryan more a few. I mean, Ryan's <laughs> given him some nice rides and he doesn't really help him. He is a hostage to fortune and gets himself into all sorts of trouble. Um, Makarova, I thought she she ran quite well in the first time cheek pieces at, at Royal Ascot. That was a pretty decent run out on the flank a little bit. She didn't have an awful lot to find. If she's going to win a nice race, it might well be this one. But I I like the improver. I like uh, Desperate Hero for, for Jack Shannon. 
ran ran and, and won very impressively in bottomless ground at Goodwood, a race that took a massive form boost subsequently. Mm. And then nobody really paid any attention because it was on heavy ground, but better ground at Hamilton won even more impressively. Horses don't win sprint handicaps like that. There's no doubt in my mind he's a pattern class horse, even though he's bred to be a, a dishwasher, really. So I... <laughs> I think um, I think he's the one I he's the one I'd be interested in. The stables had a really good season, more of which in a minute. Mm. I think Desperate Hero is the one I'd like to be with in this race. Desperate Hero currently priced up again at the time of recording seven to one. Jack Shannon, the trainer, Callum Rodriguez in the plate, bidding for that hat trick out of handicap company as well for Desperate Hero. And I'm slightly kicking myself now, Nick, because I was this close to going with Desperate Hero, but I somehow have managed to talk myself around to a horse that I would normally actively be trying to avoid. You both made the case against living the dream. The fact he's drawn out in nine, the fact that it's that stiffer uh, five furlongs on the um, pretty unique configuration of the five furlongs in the centre of the track at Sandown. And also I was so, so convinced with him last time out and he was so disappointing for me. And yes, you can say at Haydock, I know he was dropping back down into listed company there. Hence why I thought he was the good thing. Because on his reappearance start in the temple, despite the massive market drift for him, I saw, I was taking him on on that day anyway, thinking, well, he's going to have a lengthy, ambitious campaign ahead of him. Surely he's going to be worth taking on on the first time up. Yet he ran completely, he ran a blinder despite the market weakness to finish second. So I thought, right, we drop back down. Same course and distance, list the company. It's going to dot up here. Yes, he bobbled at the start. Yes, he didn't get that uncontested lead. Yes, he had the headwind facing him on that occasion. But all of those things, I still find it quite hard to forgive. Yet here I am forgiving him for that and just hoping he can prove that class will prevail. Because, yeah, Twilight Calls has been an ultimate frustration for me from Sol 1. I just fear that he's going to find more trouble again. I thought Desperate Hero was the danger, but living the dream. This is another chance then for him to hopefully show his mettle. Right, plenty of disagreement in our first race. How better do you want to start any of these previews than three tipsters giving three different selections? You're very welcome. Let us know in the comment section below who you fancy then. See if it's anything different to what we've said already. As we move on to our next race now, we're looking north up to Haydock, staging the Grade 2 Lancashire Oaks for the three-year-olds and over over a mile four at 240. Tiffany has the betting at the time of recording at seven to four. I've seen a bid to continue this winning sequence four on the bounce. Nick, she gets a quick turnaround here though. So can she go in again? Quite a quick turnaround, but Sir Mark Prescott tends to get his horses going at this time of year. So they tend not to have a very busy first part of the campaign and then he can, he can run them a little bit more often. Do I take the victory over Darnation quite as literally as the handicapper does, which makes her clear on ratings here? I'm not sure that I do. We're back on a very different surface this time. I, I think this is a more closely grouped team of, uh, of fillies and mares than the market might suggest. The one I quite like the look of out of a race that several of these ran in last time, uh, the Pinnacle Stakes, is Sea Theme, trained by William Haggis. The yard's just come into form now, and she'd shaped to me all over as though she needed the run. She was a bit keen, bit fresh, didn't really switch off, still wasn't beaten all that far. I think she's open to the most improvement of any of those that ran in this race, and she's a way, way bigger price. So C theme is my idea of the play in the Lancashire Oaks game. Oh, C theme to reverse that form with Queen of the Pride and Lady Boba from the Group 3 Pinnacle Stakes last time out. So that form line being really focused in on here, Louis, but of course, none of those uh, fillies who are recontesting that face uh, Tiffany in it, who is heading the way. So Nick's taking her on again. Again, are you being so bold? Yeah, I'm going to take her on again, Kate. I think um, Lady Boba for me stands out. I liked her run last time out. And if anything, she was kind of a bit unlucky. Um, not the fastest to weigh and got herself in a bit of trouble. Uh, a galloping track is going to suit her down to the T. Um, it's kind of a bit of a matchup for me between the two Beckett runners. I just... I'm not too keen on Forest Ferry being a three-year-old against older horses at this stage just yet. I think she looked... Still quite weak and, and immature at Epsom. I know Epsom's a very tricky track to kind of get to grips with, but the track is going to suit Forest Ferry. Only a low weight on her back, but I just think Lady Boba has done not, not much wrong really in, in her career so far. A four-year-old off a mark of 104, and it's Ross Ryan's pick. So um, Lady Boba for me can definitely turn the form around with Queen of the Pride. 
Okay, I'll pull up the form with Seed Theme, turn the form around then with Queen of the Pride, Lady Boba. The market's been struggling to reevaluate itself since the time of declarations as well, which has been fascinating to watch in its own right. I'm going to be completely unoriginal on this show, aren't I? The pair of you two have taken on the favourites in our two races so far, and I'm with them in both of these because Tiffany then, I'm going to trust in Smart Prescott, I trust then on the quick turnaround of the eight days. When Initially looking at this race, Louie, you just mentioned her forest fairy, who I, I do have a slight bias towards. I have a massive love for this filly. But in contrast to what we're going to talk about most likely later on with the Eclipse, the three-year-olds in the Lancashire Oaks don't have a fantastic record in recent years. You are more so. Um, it's worth your while being with the four-year-olds in here, which as I said, as the market has evaluated itself to being in line with. But Tiffany, though, for me, again, going around the houses, trying to take her on. I just wasn't entirely sure what to make of that Queen of the Pride form from last time out at Haydock. I thought that they went steady enough gallop. They then it turned a little bit tactical in the closing stages. So Tiffany to continue uh, this good run of form as well. And even if she just runs to the form that she showed on her most recent outing or at Baden-Baden, then that should be plenty good enough to still be taking this contest in. So unoriginal from me, but uh, Tiffany though, hopefully from still one, she'll be in an optimal position to go forwards as well. Again, different opinions. So hopefully we can keep this theme going. Again, we're giving viewers lots of options, but if not, that's what you want. Well, it remains to be seen. Right, we're sticking at Haydock now for the 315, one of the big betting heats of the weekend. The old Newton Cup handicap, four year olds and over, over a mile four. Extra place race as well with William Hill paying five places each way instead of four. Now we have four to one joint favourites at the time of recording. So, Louis, the market can't split them at this stage. Did you have more luck? Um, I mean, it's, it's quite a tricky race to, to break down and dissect. You've got a couple of old boys in here with Astro King and Yukon Glenn, probably better a Yukon Glenn on a bit of uh, cutting the ground and, and down to very good marks. So if he can kind of rejuvenate his old form, he'll be in with a chance, but it's probably a bit far-fetched um, for him this time round. But I mean, Relentless Voyager is is probably the horse for me that comes in here in, in the best form. Um I was impressed with his run last time out, but he didn't blow me away. He plugged on in the, the closing stages and it didn't really go anywhere. So I'm hoping this kind of track is going to show a bit more zip for him and he can get into um, a better position from stool nine. It's not, it's like I said, not an easy race to dissect. And there's probably, you can, you can kind of um, pinpoint some form for a lot of these horses in this race. But it's, it's one of them where I'd look for a horse with, with maybe not improvement in them, but one that, that is run run into their current mark okay running to their current mark and for you that would be relentless voyager for me yeah that would be yeah well fair enough then five to one actually as the market changes before my eyes in this one still heading the way but they say he has very evident claims all the same nick louis finally sided with the horse at the head of the market so you're going to join him well, yeah, as, as it happens, Kate, I am. <laughs> of course, of course. It, we, we managed to find the, the most competitive race of the day and we both picked the, the market <laughs> leader here. I just think this is a horse is still ahead of the posse. I think it's pretty easy to, to forgive the run last time, just simply didn't stay. And actually, there's not many clues in his pedigree or indeed run style to suggest Relentless Voyager should be staying 14 furlongs. Drop back to a sharpish 12 should suit ideally um, all the reasons that, that Louis has given. If you want one at a a much bigger price. There's a horse right down the bottom here called Mysterious Love, who's mm. never run over a mile and a half before. It mixed messages in her pedigree, but she is out of a Galileo mare, and she does shape as though she wants a little bit further. It can be deceptive when horses finish past beaten ones, as she did at Epsom last time. But I, I don't think she'll mind a mile and a half. She's drawn in stall one. She'll get a ground-saving trip from a stable that tend to bring their horses along quite quietly. You know, they might might take till their third or fourth run of the season to really start hitting peak form. We've seen what he's done in all the classics this season, David Manuizier. I think she's quite interesting at a big, big price. Mysterious love. But I, I accept uh, Relentless Voyager will run extremely well because I think he is well ahead of the game at a mile and a half. That was a huge figure he put up two starts back.
It really was, wasn't it? Yeah. So in plenty enough agreement with, with uh, relentless Voyager, but mysterious love, though, 25 to 1 for that man, David Manusi. I think all of us would love to see him have a big Saturday winner then this weekend. Now, for nature of the beast, how fickle I am, where <laughs> Relentless Voyager was the first source I was initially looking at in here and completely see the case for him, as you both said. So I will be having that bit on him then betting wise. But in terms of the horse, that might just be that bit overpriced for me for the each way play with those extra places on offer. Louis, you've mentioned him there. And it is dear old Yukon Glen, 11 years old now. And I know that you say about the... Uh, the ground conditions. There are showers about at present. The ground is officially good at good uh, at Goodwood at Haydock, but there are showers though in the forecast. Only admittedly light this afternoon, a tiny bit there in the early hours of Friday morning. But then Saturday, that's when we've got the more significant rainfall that was forecast. Um, so it's been pushed back a little bit now that earlier forecast, but. I'm hoping that that might just materialise. We know that Haydock is very much its own microclimate, so who's to say it will or won't? Should it, though, then I thought 18 to 1 about the old man of the party, Yukon Glen, might not be the worst way to go. That win last time out, that was his first for a long time, since the 2nd of July 2021, when winning a listed race. But to be fair to this horse, in his career, when he has won, he has backed it up on his next start. Not even necessarily with another success, but at least with another good run. And he might just be one of those. I know he's wily, he's wise about the game now, but he might just get that confidence boost he needed from that success last time out at a track that sees him to reasonable effect all the same. So hopefully, though, the each way play will be landed. But again, some sort of agreement. We're getting there. We're slightly starting to think along the same wavelength. Well, the lads are at least anyway. As we move on to the big one itself, of course, we save the best to last. The feature race of the weekend, the Group 1 Eclipse for the three-year-olds and over, over 10 furlongs at 3.35 at Sandown. Of course, all eyes will be on City of Troy after his incredible success in the derby. Bouncing back from his guineas disappointment and then some down in trip here, two ten furlongs. So, Nick, we know it takes a good one to win the Epsom derby and the Eclipse in the same season. Of course, Mill Reef, Nash One, Seversars, Golden Horn, the only ones to do it in the last 55 years. Latest in 2015 with Golden Horn. City of Troy, he's priced up as if he's going to be the next to join that role of honour. So can he do it? Well, it's the first derby winner since Golden Horn to attempt the Coral Eclipse. Good and point. if you look at if you look at even the other ones that have attempted it in the last 30 years, you know, horses like Authorised and Motivator, they've actually acquitted themselves pretty creditably. I don't think any of them have finished outside the three. So I don't I don't think it is a difficult task per se, or any more difficult than going derby. Irish Derby or whatever, um, you know, because you get the weight allowance. And if you've got a horse that's good enough to win the Derby, they should be good enough to win at, at 10 furlongs. It's, let's put it simply, City of Troy is the best horse and he's going to win by miles. Um, Hans Anderson's going to bounce out, set a solid enough gallop. Ryan's going to sit in second or third and he's just going to he's just going to bulldoze them all into submission. There's not a horse in here that's got a cat and hell's chance getting close to him on his best form, I don't think. Um, admirable, though some of them are. Um, if you want one that I think could could... Um, you know, we've got no White Birch in the race. We've got no Luxembourg in the race. They'd have made it interesting. Neither of them are here. If you want one that I, I think is going to win a group one at some point, it's probably JRB. But the connections didn't want to run here. They wanted to run it in the Guillaume Donano at Deauville. And they've kind of come here last minute because they're probably thinking, well, it's cutting up a bit. I don't really like plan B. Um, and I, if you want one at a much bigger price, I thought Al Riffer might run quite well. I could see him finishing second or third, maybe. Um, he, he went to New York the other day and they didn't go any kind of pace. So he got going late, but he did actually finish his race off in not a bad race. So a ground will be fine for him. I think if they go, if they go hard, he could, he could plug on into maybe into maybe third. Yeah, but potentially, just like say, the plugging on element then for it. He's a horse where I've struggled to figure out exactly what trip he wants, but so he's 28 to 1 then in here. JRB is at 20s. But Nick is a big believer that City of Troy is absolutely going to dot up then here, Louis. I mean, in your mind, who's the biggest danger first and foremost? I, I like Ghost Rider. I always have. He's a magnificent looking horse. Um, looks to have developed very well from two to three. He's very strong and, and, um, 
muscular and and Clive Cox has always had good things to say about this horse and I'm sure it's only a matter of time until we see the best of him all right some people can say maybe they didn't think he stayed in France last time out I don't think it was a case of that he wasn't a strong finisher in the guineas over a mile and he wasn't really a strong finisher in France last time out so I'm hoping maybe from a more positive ride he can just keep the revs up and, and kind of just keep grinding it out up the hill it's 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 a track Kate where when they quicken off the front end, it's very hard to quicken if you're from the back in a small field. It's, it's a hard one to work out. If you give someone a head start and he runs up the hill, it's going to take you longer to catch him. So I think um, tactics are going to be a big key in this. I know um, Hans Anderson's in here to, to kind of force the pace, but you've got to look at Dance and Gemini coming back in trip. Um, he's going to want to go forward and he's drawn on the inside of uh, City of Troy and the likes of JRB as well. So I think um, Ryan's got to be quite careful on, on where he puts this horse. But if if I was riding him in an ideal situation, I would want to sit on, on the lead horse's girths and, and basically ride him like the best horse in the race. OK, yeah. And then just like I say, just treat him exactly like he is the best horse in the race. Uh, interesting approach then to the race itself. Nick, would the length and your odds markets interest you at all? Would it appeal to me to back him to win the length of the straight? Yeah, it would actually, because because I think that's his <laughs> because th that's his forte, really. Mm. I mean, I think if they if they set the right fractions and, and really open open the others out, and you know Hans Anderson goes out and sets a stern swinging pace, and and as Louis said, I'm, I can't believe Ryan's going to be sitting way back. They're completely confident in the horse's stamina. I can see them. I, I can see them letting him open up here. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'd be. Do you, I'd do be you like him better at this trip, Nick? Uh, to be honest, Louis, I think I like him at any trip, but yeah. um, I think this should just be about right. Um, I think the track's going to suit him as well, and I think I think he'll open right out. Mm -hmm. I think he, I, I, the sound sounds quite. It can be quite difficult to to win by 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 miles, but I cer I'd certainly be keen to be backing him to win by three or four lengths or more. Yeah, I, I think what's what's nice about Sandown for, for these horses coming back in trip is when they go around that sharp bend before they enter the straight, you don't realise how much of a breather you can actually get into them, like naturally. They they naturally have to slow down to get round the bend. And if you've got one, you know how we see at Sandown when they jump out the gates and everyone wants a position, they stay out wide and then you're going flat out until the first bend and it's it's kind of quite a nice track because naturally you just kind of fill them up and then get going again. So I think the track is gonna suit this horse perfectly, City of Troy. OK, so you, you would, again, be in agreement then, Lou, with what Nick was just saying in terms of that being a play? Yeah, I, I would say, look, you don't you don't get horses that go and, well, obviously, unless they're unusual and the race is kind of developed into a, a fast run race and, and he outstays them. But I think he's probably going to, if I put a number on it, it'd be three or more lengths. I, I, okay. I think you, you've, got to, you've got to contextualise this with the opposition as well, because you know, Ghost Rider is, is, is not you know, a proven out and out stayer at this trip necessarily. Now it'll you know, ten furlongs might be his optimum in due course, but it's not it, he's not he's not a a stayer all over. Um Dancing Gemini didn't get the trip in the Derby. Ten again, this is probably his trip. But the City of Troy is a stronger stayer on all known evidence than either of those two horses. They're next in the market. JRB, we don't really know um that that he wants to to go any further than this. As I say, this is possibly his optimum trip none of the none of those are going to outstay him he is going to outclass and outstay the next three in the market yeah and i think like you say you'd be very hard pushed to argue against that theory let's say he's got the stamina himself so how on earth do you actually beat him if he is at, on his a game he's already proven the class advantage and he's got the stamina and also plenty of speed then to be booting as well. It's easier to stretch your field rather than to turn it into the test of speed. OK, so the lads are in agreement there. Over three lengths the City of Troy to win by. And of course, with being able to lengthen your odds on William Hill's site, that is going to give you a bigger price as well to make sure to utilise that concession. Um, I am interested in another market that William Hill are offering. It's a betting without market. Now, betting without City of Troy and Dancing Gemini is on there, but also just betting without City of Troy because Dancing Gemini is the one who I think is going to next best of the rest. But the each way play, essentially, I just think I'm going to be chucking away the win part of that bet. So rather than sacrificing 50% of my bet, I'd rather go in then in the without market at about six to four at a time of recording for Dancing Gemini to be able to do next best of the rest, hopefully behind City of Troy then, because 
as I say, for Kieran Schumacher, who's got the call up now for Roger Teal. And Nick, I was listening to your show there the other day and how this came about and how Kieran Schumacher has obtained the ride here. So hopefully he will be able to see the best in this horse. And after he just got bumped and pushed around everywhere at Epsom, bless him, he didn't run anywhere near as badly as the initial bear form would read. But I think the drop back in trip is what's going to really suit him. Understandably so to try the mile four, but it was a quite a jump up then in distance for him for that first attempt. But the drop back down then to the 10 furlongs here, I think we'll see him to a much better effect. And again, it's the three-year-old angle that we've all been talking about in recent years. The last three winners off this race, of course, all being age three as well. So it's going to be Dancing Gemini for me in the without market. You both think that City of Troy with the length in your odds market might just be the way to go. So even if you've got a race that is seemingly not got that much of a betting perspective. The offers are there then for you with William Hill, so make sure to utilise those. Right, lads, we've covered a lot of action there in a nice amount of detail as well. All that is left for me to do, though, is to get your nap of the day. So, Louis, you've got the short straw. You're going first. I'm going to go for a horse in the 225, the Coral Challenge. Uh, handicap Perotto. Um, I was very impressed with his run in the Royal Hunt Cup last time out after a 321-day break. He won at the Shergar Cup meeting last year in August. Um, he had a break for whatever reason, but what a comeback run. To, to run in a field like that, it's basically a cavalry charge, them races. Um, and he stayed on strongly at the line. So I think this stiff track will suit his chances. And um, Roger Varen seems to have him in very good nick. I, of all the races, I didn't expect you to go to for a nap. I was joking earlier on about being so bold, or half joking. Now that is bold then in itself. Dear old Perotto, goodness me, he's burnt a few of our fingers over the years. <laughs> Nick, are you going to go for a similar type of contest now, please? Let me see it up for you, a treat. Uh, I mean, am I allowed to go for the same race? Because that's what I oh, quite whoa. wanted to do. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Let's get a bit of, yeah, fight going. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, into, I'm, I'm into a massive Jack Shannon day. On uh, on Saturday, I like Metal Merchant in the uh, in the same race. Uh, I thought ran unbelievably well at Ascot. Just kept catching my eye, kept catching my eye, kept catching my eye. It's a very demanding straight mile that mile at Ascot. Here, at least, you get the chance to get the breather in and just slide along a bit, particularly if the ground's on the slick side. I fully, fully believe this horse is well ahead of the mark. The Newbury run behind Sunny Liston. Yeah, most most. Um, ratings organisations now have Sonny Liston right up there as a mm -hmm. borderline Group 1 horse. Oh, I'm not sure I'd buy that, but he's been putting up massive numbers given where he's at. To finish second to him, Newbury, and then to, I thought, shape like the best horse for a long way at Ascot on this more, on this easier track stamina-wise, I think uh, I think he's got a great chance, Metal Merchant, in the, uh, well, Louis gave you the time, the 2.25. Yeah, the two twenty five at Sandown, the uh, the challenge handy. He wants, he wants he wants to he wants to shoot me down in flames. I can tell. No, I'm not, I'm just saying this is like Clash of the Titans, massively so. The well, is Titans, Nick Titans. It's, it's probably a bit underdog. <laughs> it's probably a bit like the very bad ca uh, contestants on Gladiators with those. <laughs> The big earbuds. <laughs> the, yeah, the giant earbuds. <laughs> yeah, there's probably more soft play rather than Titans as such than necessarily. But Perotto and Metal Merchant going head to head. I wondered when that Jack Shannon angle was going to come back into Nick's thinking. This is where it comes in the 225 at Sandown. I'm going to let the lads get on then with their fight in a handicap company there. I'm going to go to the Distaff, the listed race at Sandown in the following race at three o'clock over the mile. Again, going to do a full book ending of unoriginality on this show for me because Soprano just thinks she wins this, thinks she upholds the form then with the reopposing indelible as well. Well, I know you can make the case for indelible at uh, Royal Ascot in the Sandringham that she was on the wrong part of the track. But at the same time, Soprano was giving her £9 there. She's having to carry the same weight this time round. The market has reassessed itself now where they probably have got the right price disparity in comparison to how they ran last time out. But Soprano, since she's come back from the wind operation, I just think she's been flying this year. So hopefully another success for her. Now back up into listed company. Right, that brings an end to our preview of Saturday 
today's braces. So a big thank you to Nick and to Louis for their time and all of their hard work as ever. A reminder of William Hill's top price guarantee offer as well. But thank you so much for watching. What did you think of our preview? Have we got it right? Well, we'll find out in due course anyway. But let us know before the action kicks off then if you're with our selections or not. And what is your nap of the weekend as well? Let us know in the comments section below and we'll speak to you again very soon. Well, thank you so much for watching our Inside Track preview. If you would like to watch Louis, Nick and I ranking our all-time greatest flat jockeys, click the link in the screen. 18 plus, please remember to gamble responsibly.